Hey everyone, thanks for joining us. I'm Miwa Messer. I am the producer and host of Barnes and Noble's podcast, Poured Over. Gary Steingart, obviously, is the author of Our Country Friends, and I'm really excited to see him again. If by any chance you've already heard the episode that we did with Gary that we released on November 2nd when the book pubbed, this is not that conversation. That was spoiler free. We are going to have spoilers in this because we are here for the book club discussion. So if spoilers are not your thing, we will try and warn you in advance. Please mute your audio if that's the case. Um, and as I said, we'll, we'll try and do our best to, to, for those of you who don't wanna hear spoilers, but we are here to talk about our country friends and why we love this book so much. So Gary, thank you so much for joining us. For folks who don't know, this is Gary's fifth novel. Do I have that right? Uh, fifth novel, sixth that's book? That's true. Sixth okay. book, fifth novel, that's right. All right, yeah. so Little Friend was the memoir, or Little Failure, little excuse failure. me. Little Failure. Little, little Failure nice. was the memoir. <laughs> The novels include Russian Debutante's Handbook and Lake Success and Absurdistan and Super, Super Sad True Love Story. Mm -hmm. There we go. There we go. But Our Country Friends is the November Barnes and Noble Book Club pick, which we're super excited about. And the reason we chose it, I was talking to Shannon DeVito, who is our director of books here. She was like, well, I love the characters. I love the characters' flaws. And I thought there was really a lot to talk about. And she is absolutely right. Mm -hmm. So... Before we get to the audience question part, can we talk about the fact that you wrote this book in real time, starting in, in real 20 time? Yeah. You yeah. didn't Thank bake you. bread. You didn't make pickles. <laughs> you wrote a novel. <laughs> Maybe I should have baked, made pickles. Yeah, no, and uh, thank you so much for having me and uh, hello out there and uh, Barnes and Noble readers. Um, yeah, when the, when the pandemic struck, I was writing a kind of academic satire. Uh, I live in New York and I was writing this kind of funny satire where NYU, New York University took over Manhattan, which it's sort of doing now anyway. But in this scenario, they actually built a wall around the island and had their own army, with the, the violet helmets, violet is the school color, all this kind of stuff. So it was sort of, you know, ha ha, uh, kind of a satire. And then uh, the pandemic started and people around me started getting sick and everything was sort of um, falling apart. So I decided um, to uh, shift gears really quickly and begin to write about what was happening. And what was happening was that, you know, uh, I was living upstate uh, in the um, about 100 miles north of New York City, which is exactly where the book takes place. But by the way, this novel has absolutely no imagination on my part. Everything, everything that's in there is is in there. You know, the, the house looks exactly like my house, except I have one little guest house. Mm -hmm. uh, and here there are five. And that's because when I was growing up, there were uh, five. I grew up in a, a Russian bungalow colony. Uh, and um, we had these little bungalows where all the kids stayed. And that was the best part of the year for me because I didn't speak any English when I came here. So for me, this was a big deal. Going upstate, hanging out with other Russian kids, speaking the language. I felt like I was normal instead of everyone making fun of me because I had these big fur hats and all these other Russian accoutrements that weren't exactly hip in 1980s, uh, you know, America. So um, that was Sasha's dream growing up was to have this little bungalow colony, sort of my dream too. I mean, I'm not crazy enough to build five bungalows. Uh, one guest house is enough. But I decided to, you know, sort of hang out there uh, and to write about the world around me, which was sort of being lonely, missing my real friends who were all over the world. Uh, but we're no longer able to, you know, hang out with me because people usually come up for the summer and stay mm -hmm. in my house or the guest house. And also um, kind of listening to nature in a way I'd never had before, like just falling in love with the silence. Uh, I, I've spent lots of time in, in my upstate house, but never for about a year in a stretch. So I decided that, and I was also reading a lot of Chekhov. Good Lord, I was reading a lot of Chekhov, both in Russian and in English and sort mm -hmm. of seeing how those sentences fell. And again, what I was saying about not having an imagination, you know, good writers, bad writers borrow, good writers just steal. So I just kind of took that tone and began to apply it to the Dude, country. I went hunting for this in my own bookcase the yeah. other day. Yeah. Just, I think you might have the same edition. I mean, it's really, I think, really, I, really old. It's the yeah, vintage it's, it's edition. it's an old one. There's a new one by the people that did the uh, Anna Karenina and War and mm -hmm. Peace translation, the Balkonskis, I think. Yeah, uh, there it's really good. It's a really great translation. I think it's called Twenty or Forty Stories too, but it, it's a new translation. Very good. Okay, I will go hunt that down. Hey, Harry, in the background, can we launch the first poll question? I'm curious to see how many people who are joining us today have read 
um, check off. I don't know if we can launch, I'm, I'm asking these questions out of order. So I'm hoping we can launch the poll question out of order. We might have to go in the order I gave them to Harry. I don't know, we're trying a new feature guys. So bear with us for a second, but I'm just curious to see. So if you have the latest version of Zoom, you will be able to participate in this poll question as soon as we get it up and running. Um, and Ron Gutierrez, I will try and get to your question because that's a really good question. I have all sorts of screens open while we wait for the poll questions to, to launch. Um, Gary, you have written, while we're waiting for the tech to back us up here, a really beautiful novel about friendship, which isn't something we often see. I mean, family, right? Family is like the thing yeah. that is really kind of reliably yeah. book group territory, right? Like everyone's <laughs> yeah, got yeah. a family, everyone's got- Yeah, everyone's you know, got a family. Yeah. Variations yeah. of, <laughs> yeah. But, but why fam uh, why friendship? For you. Yeah, I think, you know, especially since my first couple of books dealt with the immigrant experience, and that's something I'm really interested in. And obviously, six out of the eight characters uh, in the book are, are immigrants. But yeah, I was I was really interested in I've done so many books about family, and I've done so many books about romance, about people falling in love with each other. I mean, one of my books was called Super Sad True Love Story, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, see, my books always advertise what they're about. Like, you know, that's a book about love and our country friends is a book about friendship. Uh, you, you get what you, what you, you know, what you see on the tin. Uh, and I think it's because in my, a couple of things. First of all, I'm in my late 40s. I'm about to be 50. And at this point, friendship means even more to me. I mean, so many of our, uh, of my contemporaries, their parents have either passed away or have moved to Florida, which is also very far away, you know, in a kind of Seinfeld sense, they don't really see them uh, very often. Um, and so I think our friendships have become more important to us. Uh, also to a lot of immigrants, they are kind of important because as much as we love our parents, they weren't always able to give us advice that really kind of worked in the American context. Like I have a great Indian American friend and his father would tell him, Son, you know, your muscle tone is so low, no woman will ever love you. So you have to go to engineering school uh, and do really well. You know, that was his advice, you know, that, that he had such low muscle tone and he had to go to engineering school. So stuff like that, I got plenty of that. And that was completely useless, right? So uh, we kind of became each other's parents and siblings, sometimes lovers as well. And all these groups of friends coalesced around sort of a need like that. And so I just took that and kind of made that kind of like a big chill type of scenario, right? Where they all get together, they're in their late forties. They kind of been issued a, a report card. You know, they all come from these very ambitious immigrant families. They've been kind of given a report card about how well they've done in different ways, uh, who's successful, who's not in every different realm from being a good parent, which only, you know, one person really qualifies Masha, right? To being successful in their career. Like Karen is super wealthy at this point. Um, um, and or to being, you know, the only virtuous person around, which I would guess is Benud, you know, so everyone has something that they're good at. Uh, and also the other part of it is that that during the pandemic, all these people I hadn't heard from in ages began to, and this may have happened to some of you, uh, began to form all these groups on Zoom where, you know, people I haven't heard from from 30 years and kind of didn't want to hear from, but they were all sort of, you know, like, hey, join us on Zoom. It's our, you know, it's freshman year high school reunion. And I'm like, great, you know. But because I was writing this book, I started tapping into all those links because I right. wanted to deal with what friendship was like during the pandemic. And a lot of it, as you know, was, was kind of virtual. And also for Sasha, and some of you might consider this a spoiler, but for Sasha, it's different levels of friendship. There's Karen and Vinud from high school. Then there's Ed, who I'm fond of, who you call the Korean bride's head revisited. I'm never going to get over that. I, I just, that's such a great line. And it's so evocative for me. I also happen to like Evelyn Waugh quite a lot. Oh, good. But okay, good, good. They pick up Ed at a party sometime yeah. after college. They pick him up at a party in Brooklyn and yeah. he becomes part of their gang. There's a writer that has studied with Sasha. She comes up D and she's got a little different view of the world and she really, really wants to be noticed. Oh, and my, then yes. There's the actor who doesn't even get a name. <laughs> <laughs> he does towards the very end. I mean, there's yes, a spoiler yes. alert. He has a terrible, like the most prosaic na name possible. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but let's talk about why you put these people together. Because there's Sasha, his wife, their child, yeah. Matt. So you've yeah. got a family unit, but then these other people that you've layered in. Yeah, yeah, there's, there's different modes of friendship. I mean, so first, yes, first there's the family. And the family is complicated in its own right because uh, their child is adopted. Uh, she's gender fluid. So there's already a lot of, you know, this isn't the old, typical, old fashioned American family. Uh, and also, but then the second layer is the three friends, you know, which is Sasha, uh, uh, Karen and Benud. And 
you know, and, and Masha is already very jealous of them because she realizes that that's the kind of friendship, she realizes that's the kind of friendship she never had. And she also kind of intuits, I mean, she's a psychiatrist after all, she kind of intuits that the reason she's never had friendships like that is because her parents are, although they're also from Russia, uh, they're actually kind of decent immigrant parents and they've raised her okay. And she's never needed friends like that, you know. In fact, the only person that she was that close to was her sister who's died. Uh, so, uh, so there's those three friends and, all of them have different expectations of each other. So Sasha, spoiler alert, uh, betrays Vinod in a terrible way because he can't help but being the, the main dog. And in some ways, even though he's not physically that much in love with Karen, although spoiler alert, there's some of that too, but he's, you know, he um, also kind of wants to show off in front of her and, and in front of the whole world by being successful and not having Vinod be a competitor. Uh, at the same time, Vinod, of course, is in love with Karen in a way that Sasha isn't in love with Karen. And, Karen has maybe brotherly feelings toward Vinod, but is also competitive with Sasha, especially when it comes to the fact that Sasha has a family and, and she never had she never had children. Although now when she sees uh, Nat, she sort of realizes that this is the child that she could have and always wanted to have. So again, as with any friendship that goes back, you know, decades, there's all of these different crisscrossing things. And I started to look at my own friends and realize that those things were going on even with, that I hadn't even realized before because I was so busy thinking about, you know, my own parents and, the, you know, my own family, the small family I have around me. But this was like, oh, my God, there's been so much going on over these decades. And now with the pandemic happening, all of this is coming to light. Well, and also friendship changes with time. Our friendships in our 20s don't look like our friendships in our 40s and they don't look like our friendships in our 50s and our 60s either. Yeah. So what was that like for you sort of walking these guys through? Because there's a, you're writing the tip of the iceberg. Right. I mean, what you have in the compound at the house and everything else with these particular characters, it is very much a set piece. But you as the writer need to know everything that's happening below the surface. Yeah, it's tough. I mean, you know, the, the old writing exercise, I teach writing at Columbia mm -hmm. on the master's program and the old writing exercise, which kind of makes sense is that before, if you're doing something like a novel, even a short story, but especially with a novel, you write yourself a bio of all of your characters. So you answer mm -hmm. all of the basic questions. You almost write them a, a CV, a resume, you know, what they did, where they were born, where they went to school, um, what their biggest dreams are, what their biggest disappointments are. You know, I, that's a pretty good exercise. I, after you write a bunch of books, I think it comes a little bit easier and you're sort of able to intuit, intuit it. But the other technique obviously is that you borrow a little bit from people you know. Uh, and hopefully you're not using a one-to-one -one correspondence, although people often don't realize that you've done that. I mean, I, I, sometimes I've done characters that are so reminiscent of, of real life people and they just don't get it because people don't ever understand who they are. They never see themselves as for who they are. Um, but, you know, in this case, it was like borrowing little things like, you know, you're talking about Ed Kim, Bright said revisited and he had, the, there's one guy that I, you know, had some Eddish qualities and he had this great thing where he, whenever he would fall in love with someone, and he'd be talking to them, he'd be so shy and he constantly put his like, you know, his, his hand to his ear, right? And so I kind of wanted to do that, but I didn't want to make fun of him either because when you're a kid, you're making fun of him. When you're in your 20s, you're like, oh God, that poor guy, you know? But now you really kind of feel for them because, you know, he's, he's, in his, uh, he's in his late 40s and he's still doing that. Like he's still never been able to find love. And he's still obviously, despite the fact that he's so wealthy and privileged, he's still so shy that when he falls in love with someone, he has to put his ear, his hand to his ear, like he's talking to Sputnik or something, you know? So stuff like that, I think, I think as you grow older, you, you become more, you have more empathy toward your friends, um, especially the ones that haven't realized all of their dreams, then you kind of begin, well, I mean, nobody ever realizes all of their dreams, right? But, you know, uh, you kind of become more aware of how, you know, of how they've come short and how it hurts them and you want to help them in any way possible. If, if you've done, you know, if you've had 20 years of psychoanalysis like me anyway, yeah. <laughs> Okay, so let's also talk about the way you layer in Chekhov, though, because this is sure. kind of new for you. This is, and I know you and I had this conversation earlier. This is a mellower book for you, Gary. Yeah, this it's is mellower. a mellower book. Yeah, yeah. It is. I mean, it goes back again, just to what I was saying. Like when you're, you know, the books that I wrote, I wrote the first two books when I was in my 20s or early 30s. And I mean, I was an angry young man. I was very much in a satirical mode. I was railing against the society in which I grew up, the Soviet Union, and maybe aspects of America that I wasn't exactly copacetic about. So, and, and also really against the way I was brought up in a religious school and also my parents with whom I've had a lot of difficulties growing up. So there's a lot of stuff that I was really kind of angry about and satire becomes sort of the, uh, the very easy mode of the angry young man. Now, I'm not saying I, I, I wish I hadn't written those books. I mean, they're very much, you know, and I think there are people who prefer those books. I mean, people who come to me for satire and then they get this Jacobian book, you know, with elements of satire, obviously, but with mm -hmm. more Chekhov than Gogol or, or you know, mm -hmm. Swift. 
are like, huh, I don't know about that. I, my 28 bucks was going on satire. Um, but I think slowly my books have been edging that way. And I think, again, it's, it's the mellowing that's happened from being older and not being so judgmental about people maybe, uh, but also having a kid of my own and sort of being able to leave my own mind and my own sort of the, the anger and prejudices of the past and being able to sort of begin to have empathy for somebody who's a, who has a lot of your DNA granted, but is also, you know, a, a, a new a newfangled creature out in the world. And, and that I think um, mellows the way I treat my characters, even though some of these characters are written to be funny. I mean, hopefully, you know, the readers agree that it's, it's a somewhat funny book. Uh, for example, D, right, who uh, will do anything to get noticed. And, you know, she's left, but then she flirts with the far right. I mean, you know, she's a political mishmash and then of course it, it bites her in the butt, but for a while, you know, uh, that's what generates sales for her as being that, that kind of person. And I think there might be some folks who read into our country friends that Sasha might be a little bit of your avatar because you always have a character who's always an avatar-ish. I don't want to yeah. say, because this is not yeah. autofiction. Even though you wrote it during the pandemic and it's set in upstate New York, it's not autofiction. This is a novel yeah. that is inspired, obviously, by yeah. New York, but sure. that's kind of what novels do, right? They show us a mirror on our own lives and our own society. Absolutely. That's the whole point of the art, That's right? the whole point. That's the whole point. <laughs> that's the whole point. You know, there's no novel that's not in some ways autobiographical mm -hmm. in one way or another. I had a student at Columbia who was writing about a planet of gay dragons, you know, on, on Alpha Centauri. There were all these gay dragons, but they were clearly him and his family and his lovers. I mean, right. you know, just because they had, you know, very long dragon names was not a reason for them not to be him. And I think, I mean, I remember I was writing Lake Success, my previous book, which was the first book I wrote that didn't have Russian immigrants at all. Had immigrants, had a, a Tamil uh, Indian American immigrant, but uh, mm -hmm. didn't have any Russians almost at all. And the guy had nothing to do, the main character or one of the two main characters had nothing to do with writers or, or, or immigrants. And he was this hedge fund guy. He was this billionaire, which I clearly am not, you know. And I remember my, my shrink read it and was like, well, that character actually has a lot of view in it. And I was like, no, oh my God, you know, I, I tried so hard to, to get away from that. And, but the, the, the thing is, you never do. You know, you're always in one way or another constantly processing the world you grew up in, the life that you've been given for better or for worse, and often for worse. You know, I, I mean, I know a lot of writers, obviously, and this isn't the happiest bunch of people in the world. And I would say the same for, for many artists. And I think it's because, uh, you know, problems growing up, uh, problems acclimating, accommodating other people, that leads to uh, the kind of person that needs to chronicle it as opposed to participating in the world in a different way. I'm also guessing that when you're writing a novel in real time, which you have not done until now, this is, yeah. this is the first opportunity you had to yeah. write a novel in real time, that it changes the editing process, it changes possibly the writing process itself like were you yeah. writing straight through or were you straight doing through. sort of okay straight through yeah yeah and it's straight through and so um you know the murder of george floyd uh, is mentioned in the book that was so i was writing that i don't know maybe a week after after it happened i think something like that uh because it was obvious that everything was changing around me and then you know and seeing the reaction so i was living next to a, a couple of very bougie villages uh, upstate where, you know, all the customers may be white, but there was a lot of sort of anti-racist stuff in the windows. So the way people were reacting to that among a very certain class of New Yorkers or second home New Yorkers, if you would say, you know, because there's also this huge division between people who have a second home and people who live full time in, 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 a, in, a, in a part of the world. So all of that was happening and it was riveting. I mean, it was absolutely riveting because mm -hmm. every week or two, given the pandemic, given the reaction of our government, you know, to the pandemic, all of this stuff, every week you had basically enough material for a novel of, of its own. You know, it was like writing during World War II where every month brought a, either some fresh horror or, or toward the end of the war, a fresh victory that maybe moved the needle one way or another. Your life was dictated in some ways by what was happening in the news. You know, your worries, your anxieties about your children, your family, your friends, your parents, everything was out there. Uh, and, you know, for a novelist who's always written about contemporary events, even when I'm writing a, mm -hmm. a you know, a, a, a futuristic satire, like super sad true love story, you know, as much as I was devastated by the, the, you know, millions of people who have died around the world, it was also like catnip to me. I was like, wow, this is what I've been writing about all along in a sense when things fall apart and the society isn't quite there to pick up the pieces.
And I'm going to use this moment too, because we have a lot of great questions that people submitted prior to the event when they were registering. And there are also some good questions in the Q&A module. For folks at home, if you want to go ahead and drop your questions into the Q&A module, that's the best place to do it. You can also drop them in the chat, um, but it would be great. So if you don't know how to do that, go to the bottom of your screen, hover your mouse over, and a Q&A will pop up. And you can just click on that and go from there. Ron Gutierrez dropped in a cool uh, question here. I'm enjoying the novel very much. I'd like to ask the author about a skillful use of multiple POVs throughout the page. I see this in many quote ensemble type novels lately and would like to know what his rules are for how and when to use this technique. Wow, yeah. So that's that's a fascinating question. Thank you. That's really a very uh, uh, craft oriented question, the kind that I often get in uh, in, my, in my graduate workshop at Columbia on, on, on novel writing. It's hard. It's hard. I mean, I, I haven't tried this before because it is so hard. I've often written, you know, the sort of go to uh, technique that I usually, that most of us teachers of creative writing tell writers, especially when they're starting out, is the first person is your friend, you know, which is the I, uh, you know, I did this, I did that, because, you know, just when you're developing your voice, it's very important to try to have a kind of connection to a person who's thinking within their own mind and who's then letting it out on paper. So there's a kind of almost performative aspect to it, right? Uh, a lot of great fiction has been about people who have commandeered that I and are saying, I have a story to tell and I'm gonna put it on the page and it's I, I, I. I know that can get a little annoying too. Uh, then there's the third person, which often, when I've used the third person, I've often cleaved to one or two characters. And I did that in my first novel. There's a third person, but it's all about Vladimir Gershkin, the main hero does this, Vladimir Gershkin does that, Vladimir Gershkin thinks this, Vladimir Gershkin feels that. So it's almost like being there. But this technique, which I think I thought, okay, I've written five books already. This is my sixth book. Maybe I can graduate to this technique, right? Uh, and that I think is very, almost has a kind of 19th century Russian feel to me, not just Chekhov, but Tolstoy and others, which is like, you are this omniscient God and you're floating around and you're able to zip very carefully and very quickly into the mind and the feelings of another person, ascertain those feelings and then zip right out, you know. Uh, so when I'm when I'm looking at, at, at Ed um, Kim and he's he's got his hand on his on his ear and he's I can go in and be like and Ed is thinking, oh, God, I'm doing it again. Why am I doing this again? You know, which is, again, a very uh, kind of uh, omniscient free floating narrator kind of form. And then I can do that within a paragraph. I can do that within a sentence. You know, I can go in as, as, as lightly. And again, if I was just a beginning novel, novelist, I would screw this up in so many ways because this, this, this really is a kind of um, a somewhat advanced technique. And it's only, and it's not even through writing the five books, it's, it's in reading, you know, I mean, the most important part of being a writer is reading and reading and reading and reading and being able to keep up, not just with, with, with the wonderful contemporary books that are coming out, but also dipping into the books that form you as a writer, in my case, a lot of the Russian greats. So yes, thank you for noticing that. And that's been my, and that's been, if, if, I've, if, if I've done any kind of advance with this novel, it's I think exactly what you've mentioned in your, in your question. Yeah. Okay, we have another craft question, Gary, from M. Hofberg. How do you set out to plan the overall structure of the novel and then proceed to flesh it out with such mm. sparkling character development? Oh, thank you. That's, that's that's sweet of you to say. Um, so first of all, I mean, there's novels, I've written novels that require so many plot twists. So this novel, Absurdistan, I wrote in my late 20s, early 30s, had, I remember writing out that the outline, it was 132 like bullet points because all these things had to happen. There was, I was creating this other this country called Absurdistan, which had these two warring, I mean, it was like writing, it was almost like writing a television series where you, where you not only just flesh out a certain bunch of characters, and I've done a lot of work in TV, but you also flesh out an entire, it's world building. You're building a whole world, you know, sort of like a Game of Thrones, for example, right? But so here I had to flesh all this out and I had 132 things that had to happen. By the end, maybe half of those things that happened, but it was incredibly plotted out. But this is a little bit different. I knew that certain things had to happen. Like I knew that, spoiler alert, somebody had to suffer a horrifying health crisis because obviously I'm not going to write about COVID and then, you know, it's the whole checkoff thing. If there's a gun in the first act that has to go off by the third act, right? So obviously I had to have something like that happen. Um, and then the major part of it was figuring out who these eight characters would be. And I didn't even have the number eight. I just started building my world and thinking, well, who would it be? I mean, so I came up with the, you know, the three friends were very easy because so many of my friends fit a lot of the profiles of those characters in terms of having grown up with me, immigrants, uh, uh, Korean, Indian, Russian, had gone to a math and science high school like I did. Uh, and, um, you know, uh, so that, that part was kind of easy to do. And then I was like, okay, I have all of the ingredients. Now I need, I need to light a match. Who's gonna be that lit match? 
And then the character of the actor came to me, and again, because I've done so much work in television, so I know a lot of these actors, and I've always wanted to write about them because some of these very kind of high-end actors are really fascinating. There's a great article in this week's New Yorker about the uh, succession actor Jeremy Strong. I can't recommend it highly enough because it's written kind of straight, but it's the funniest and inadvertently most satirical thing I've ever read. It's and wild. It's, it's, it's wild. wild. <laughs> so <laughs> wild. And I think to me, the actor was sort of like that, except I couldn't have written that because people would have thought I'd be making it up. This often happens when, you, when you're a satirical writer, you can't go too far because people are like, nah, that doesn't really happen. You know, People said that about Super Sad and so many of the things in that book have already come true, right? But back then they were, and people were like, huh, that's impossible. So anyway, that, that, that was my, uh, my take on it. So the actor creates, because everyone's in love with him and everyone's sleeping with him, that creates its own kind of lit match. Okay, but Jackie Kornbluth wants to know why you didn't give the actor a name. <laughs> I think it's because if I gave him a name, I, I like the idea that everyone is projecting things to him. So on my social media feeds, people have been sending me all the people they want to play the actor, who they think the actor is. And I mean, it, it is a wide range. And if you Google <laughs> some of the actors I've actually worked with, people kind of get ideas there. And it, like I said, there's no one single person. But if I gave him a name, that would sort of take away people's idea to project their own actor onto this because there are so many wonderful sort of pretentious actors out there. Jeremy Strong, mm. now, that, now that that New Yorker article has come out, now everyone's going to be, because I have worked on <laughs> now everyone's going to be like, is that Jeremy Strong? And they'll be like figuring out how old Jeremy Strong is and stuff like that. But I really didn't want to, I didn't want to interfere with the reader's pleasure in building their own actor. But that's a good question. <laughs> um, and I'm going to follow that up with a really fun question, actually, too. How do you tell if an idea that's funny in your head while you're thinking about it uh, will actually be funny on paper. What's your process and what's your hit rate? And that's from Dan Lerman. Oh, uh, um, sorry, can you repeat that question? I, sure, I sure, sure, sorry. sorry. How do you tell if an idea that's funny in your head oh. while you're working on it is gonna work on paper? And then Dan's also asking what your hit uh, rate is. <laughs> oh, okay, okay, good, 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 good. Um, <laughs> that's a funny question. And, and, and I'm about to teach a class at Columbia on writing funny. Uh, because it's really hard to do. In some ways, it's harder than writing tragedy because you have to have all of the stuff that you have in tragedy happen when you're writing a funny book, but it also has to be on that kind of entertainment level. I mean, my technique is always like joke, joke, sad, 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 joke, 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 sad, sad, joke, sad, right? So you're constantly changing the register because in a way you're trying to surprise the reader. If it's just going to be ha, 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 that's then, then the humor kind of begins to lose some of its potency because the reader is just sort of, I mean, you know, I can't drink a 32 ounce milkshake. I love milkshakes. You know, I can do an eight ounce milkshake. 16 is pushing a 32. No, I can't do it. Right. And, and that's true of almost anything, you know, almost any food that I love. And I love a lot of food, but I can't do it. So I think that's the same. I have the same feeling toward fiction. Um, when a joke comes to me and jokes come to me all the time. So that's the thing, right? So, I mean, I wake up, there's jokes floating through my mind. I dream about jokes. I dream I'm making jokes, you know, um, I love, you know, when I'm teaching or something, I'm constantly making jokes. Uh, when I'm on the Amtrak, I'm making jokes. So there's constant, and then I write some of them down. Now the hit rate is interesting. I would say 50%. And here's the thing, you know, there's a lot of readers who don't, I mean, they come to my work and they're not even interested in humor, which is kind of funny, right? Why would you do that given, you know, that I have a reputation as a comic writer, but whatever, you know, and especially books like this, right? Which is a Chekhovian book and Chekhov actually was quite funny. But the humor was bone dry. I mean, and, and a lot of it, and some of it is actually lost in translation, I have to say a little bit. Mm -hmm. because a lot of that humor was about different registers. And even if, some of it is even lost on me because I'm not a 19th century Russian, right? Which is the same as you would be reading, you know, uh, 19th century stuff today. So um, the hit rate is maybe 50%. You know, what's funny actually is that social media, because I'm on stuff like Twitter a lot, follow me on Twitter. Um, I sometimes try out jokes on Twitter and at Steinberg, and um, you know, I see that oh, nobody really likes this joke, and, and, and then I'm like, okay, if if you know, if all these followers don't get my joke, then maybe this isn't a really, or it's only funny to me. I mean, that's the only that's the real problem with humor is that it, you know, it's not objective at all. I mean, it's the most objective thing ever. Uh, you know, if if you're reading about you know the death of a of a young child, okay, we're all feeling incredibly sad about that, unless you're completely heartless, that hits it. But jokes. No, you know, what's funny to you is not funny to me, or probably vice versa. What's funny to me may not be funny to you. 
Okay, I want to come back to Chekhov for a second. Melissa Wagner is asking, was your use of the fallen birch branches a mm. nod to the cherry orchard being destroyed slash chopped down or more representative of the unraveling of Sasha's life and spirit? All of it. Thank you. <laughs> yes, yeah, all of it. It was a great thing. But again, you know, going back to my lack of imagination, that summer, you know, it, I mean, the pandemic, all kinds of destruction upon the world, but also where I was, these lightning storms, just almost to accentuate the apocalyptic and tropic nature of everything, were ravaging my property upstate to the point where, I mean, it was almost like beyond symbolic. So I, I have like, just like the, uh, the book cover, I have this very long driveway, you know, and you go and you go, it's like, you know, you're driving and driving and driving. And these giant trees, birches, and otherwise, I, I mean, we don't have cherry trees, we do have an apple tree. And all of them are falling on this driveway. And so that, you know, you had to, I mean, cars couldn't get through. I mean, it was a real disaster. So there was a kind of, you know, uh, there was a real, real life event, but also, yes, I was thinking of all the Chekhovian references to trees. Uh, Uncle Vanya is sort of the er play when it comes to this because it's staged, spoiler alert, at the end of the book, but also, you know, all of Chekhov's plays and stories or all of the best Chekhov plays and stories are always in the countryside, always about people who are in their 30s and 40s, their lives didn't quite work out, now they're trying to figure out why, they love somebody, somebody doesn't love them back. I mean, you know, it's an old formula, but it works. So yeah, absolutely, I was thinking of, of, of Chekhov, uh, but also thinking about, you know, the reality of, of how, while all this pandemic stuff was happening, half of my property seemed to be falling down on itself, you know, while lightning was striking it. I mean, talk about metaphor, you know, <laughs> the hand of God almost. And David Emmerich is asking, do you have a favorite Chekhov short story or one that you strongly recommend? Yeah, there's a bunch. So a bunch went into this book when I was thinking about it. And that's, again, just as I was saying, there was a bunch of stories that kind of formed this cycle, um, particularly the English translations about love, the man in the shell, gooseberries. I think those three come to mind readily. Those are great because, they, I mean, those were really inspirational because it's all men sitting around in the banya, the Russian bathhouse. They're getting, they're drinking vodka or whatever, and they're talking about other people's lives. There's a kind of the Cameron kind of effect where they're talking about other people's lives, but at the same time, they're really talking about themselves and their own problems with life and the, their own shortcomings, you know, and that kind of is the mode of this of this book? You know, it was funny when I was uh, when I was first pitching it to my editor because I abandoned this novel in the middle of everything, and, and I was pitching it to him. And I was like, "It's like Chekhov meets The Big Chill," <laughs> and then I think rather than I was actually use that as a tagline, uh, but that was sort of the the funny thing I was thinking because it was so reminiscent of of, of both of those works. Those are very different works and different kind of you know medium brow and high brow stuff. But I kind of made you know <laughs> a different brow out of them, so to speak. And Glenn Miller has a question too about this new gear that you've hit in your work. Uh, let's see, uh, hope you're not superstitious, but would love to hear what it feels like to break through and know that you've done the best work you've done. And is there fear or excitement about the process moving forward? Always, always. I mean, I, sorry, there's a giant ambulance right. passing. Uh, I am always distrustful of writers who say, I've done great work, I can't believe it. I mean, what's wrong with you? What kind of, a, what kind of an artist are you? That, that's the wrong attitude. The attitude should be, ah, it's over, but I, I know I can do better. You know, I, I, I can always do better. And yeah, absolutely with this, I was very, I was very worried about this book uh, as I was writing it, because first of all, you know, six, seven months, I've never written anything so fast in my life with almost no research. Yeah, with, all, with absolutely no research. I mean, again, I was writing about things as they were happening. It almost felt too good to be true. And I remember sending it to my editor and agent being like, all right, they're just going to tell me it's a disaster, you know, and then I'm going to have to go back to that NYU novel that I abandoned, right? Which, which now I don't want to go back to because I, 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 I really did feel like I hit a different register. And I feel like I've been trying to do that with all of my books. I'm not saying that I'm never going to write a mm -hmm. non-satire, but with the last three novels, especially, you know, Super Sad True Love Story, which was about this very, in my mind, heartbreaking relationship between these two kind of, these two people who should love each other, but society has kind of, you know, the traditional Romeo and Juliet kind of society won't let them come together, right? And Lake Success, which was about uh, parents raising a child on, 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 a, on the spectrum, so having a, a child with a disability. And now this, which is about friendship, but also coming to terms with a society that's not functioning the way it should be. And also worried about, you know, everyone is always worried about Nat growing up uh, because she's 
growing up in a world with all of these problems, ecological, political, pandemic, you know, all these different problems. So uh, it did feel like a new gear, it, 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 but I, I have to keep going. I mean, I'm already starting to think of the next book and I'm, I'm already scared about it. I haven't written one sentence of it. You know, I haven't written, I haven't even talked to my editor about what it might be, you know, I, uh, and I'm already scared to death that it's going to be terrible, but that's good because you don't want to let your guard down. You don't want to just float into writing something. You want to really think it through. Okay, I have a non-craft question for you though. And this was just dropped in by an anonymous attendee who I hope sometime will use their real name because it's more fun when you have a name attached to it. Um, question about the app. Anonymous attendee is not entirely sure what the deal was with the app. Why couldn't D and the actor just, oh, sorry, spoiler. Um, why couldn't they have just done it old school? I mean, I love the app. I love the idea oh, of the oh, app. I see, I, you I know what I mean? It, it's, yeah, 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 yeah. No, I, I wanted to, so this was another sort of, influence of, uh, of reading, uh, in this case, it was, I was reading a lot of Shakespeare the year before and mm -hmm. she, Shakespeare's so good at, oh God, he's just so good at getting plots going. You know, he can really start things up. And I was thinking of A Midsummer Summer Night Dream, which is not my favorite of his plays, kind of, you know, but I like it when he borders on the silly in, 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 in a Shakespearean way. And this was, for me, I love the love potion. And of course, I mean, it's not like, Shakespeare invented the love potion, but I thought that, you know, Puck and all that stuff was such a great character. So I wanted to have a kind of love potion this as opposed to people just falling in love. But I also wanted to, as, as the pandemic was going on, we all became even more in touch with social media because so many of our real life interactions were falling apart. And I wanted to make a statement about, um, um, about um, you know, what it's like to have um, social media, not just, be a part of our lives and, and like we're talking to each other, but also change our lives. Because so many people began to use social media as, I mean, you know, people would spread misinformation on social media and algorithm would figure out what you, what kind of misinformation you wanted and give you this information. I mean, I'm someone who a lot of my family isn't vaccinated because they've read things about how the vaccines will kill you. you know? So all of that stuff was happening in real time. Um, and I was thinking a lot about how uh, I wanted some. I wanted an algorithm to change the course of the novel, which I know is a tall order, but that's essentially what I wanted to happen. And and so Karen invents this stuff, and you know it's. But also it's about how people, you know, when people go on something like Instagram, they fall in love with somebody based on their posts. You know, so many of my friends first begin to fall in love with somebody almost entirely through social media. And then maybe they'll give them a chance in real life. But the fact that we now audition people on social media was another sort of factor in this. So in a way, this algorithm kind of moves pe pe people together and that's why the actor falls in love with D. Okay, Tatiana Khan, that spoiler is over. So I'm gonna ask your question now. Gary, do you read Chekhov in Russian or English or both? And that's from both. Tatiana Khan. Khan. Hi, Tatiana. Hi, Tatiana. Both, both. And, and Chekhov was the first writer, the first serious writer I read in Russian when I was still a kid, nine, 10, stuff like that, I, because he's a lot, especially at that point, I was reading a lot of his short stories that are his earlier short stories, a lot of which was about young people. Some of them were pretty funny. One was set entirely from the point of view of a dog. Um, so, but I also, when I was writing this book, I wanted to read him in the English translation. And also because, well, first of all, because there's been some amazing English translations just came out, but also because I kind of wanted to feel that, I mean, what does Chekhov sound like to an American or an English ear? You know, what do those cadences sound like? Um, because in my mind, I have my own Russian Chekhov going on, but I also wanted to, to have that soundtrack. And this has been true of every novel I've written, except maybe Lake Success, where all characters, characters aren't Russian, is when I'm writing any kind of Russian character, I have a kind of second soundtrack going on, which is the Russian soundtrack. And then I intersperse that with the, uh, with the English soundtrack. And that means that even if I'm writing about an American character, sometimes the way the wor word order, the choice of words, may change and, and sort of in, and interact a little bit with the Russian. One of my greatest um, inspirations growing up was Vladimir Nabokov, author of Lolita and other books, who also, his best work, I think, actually is in English, but always with that kind of Russian soundtrack going on in the back of his mind. Who else do you, and before I get back to audience questions, who else do you like to read and who else have you been reading lately where you're just like, wow, I know you and I talked about Luster by Raven Leron. Luster so. is great. Oh, Luster by Raven Leron. So yeah, so you know, a lot of what I'm reading is also dependent on the kind of stuff I'm teaching. So this year I'm teaching humor in Colombia. So Luster by Raven Leilani, uh, Fleischman's in Trouble by 
Oh God, her name is complicated. Taffy Broad Bro Broder Broadner Ackerman. Uh, oh, I should God, know this I'm... off the top of my head. This is terrible. Sorry, I, well, I should know it because I'm teaching her. But yes, yes, Fleischman. Her first name is definitely Taffy. Taffy, which is the name and her last name is definitely forget. hyphenated. And we're so sorry that we're hyphenated. I... Sorry, Taffy. Uh, so that's really funny. Um, um, and uh, then I teach a course on immigrant fiction. So you know, my mentor was Chang Ray Lee, the Green American author. Uh, I teach Jhumpa Lahiri. I teach God. Um, Oh, I actually teach Nabokov in, in that class because he actually does mm -hmm. qualify as an immigrant. So yeah, that's yeah, a whole bunch of- You've also taught Roth too, haven't you? Back in the I've day? Taught, uh, Henry or Philip, I taught both actually. I taught oh, Henry well, Roth. Well, I was thinking Philip, Lee. sorry. Philip Roth, yeah, <laughs> Philip Roth, I taught him in this class. Yeah, also a class on sort of on humor. I taught Portnoy's Complaint, which is mm -hmm. so funny to teach. And I think the young people, young students love it because it, it is like, you know, people love stand-up comedy, but it's like a giant stand-up comedy act. Mm -hmm. And and that can only exist in the first person, right? So, you know, that's a good example of, of not using third person to, to articulate something. Okay, so Brenda Lazar has a question for you, and I have my own answer to this, and I'm not sure we can totally answer this, but, you know, she's asking where we start with your backlist. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I'm just like, well, you could read them in order, but it's more for me like a mood, like maybe you want the memoir, little failure first, and then you can fill in as you want with yeah. the well, I don't know. How do we answer this question? <laughs> it's really fun. If you read the memoir first, you can little failure the memoir, then you can go through the books and be like, oh my God, now I know what really happens. And he's just repurposing it, you know. I don't know, like if you are into broad crazy satires where it's where it really is kind of a joke a minute then absurdistan i think might be your book uh which was my second book or the first if you're into sort of you know a first a first novel from a kind of immigrant perspective and those there have been some amazing ones or even any kind of sort of a group that's in america somewhat marginalized like for i mean invisible man comes to mind ralph ellison right but but this one is billed as a comedic book. Then Russian Debutant's Handbook, my first book comes to mind. If you're into books about slightly futuristic and you know about a technology run amok, but you're also really into love stories, Super Sad True Love Story is, is your book. Uh, and if you're into road bo books about road trips, uh, Lake Success, for which I actually took like a two month journey across the country by Greyhound bus, which was the most frightening thing ever uh, in every way possible, then that's your book for sure. Okay, Gary, Linda Cass has bailed us both out. It's Taffy Brodeser Ackner. Thank Brodeser you, Linda. Ackner. Thank you. Thank Linda. you. Thank yeah. you. It was, we both yeah. had giant brain bursts at the same time. Taffy's an excellent name. I wish I was named Taffy. Yeah. She also does really great celebrity profiles and it's yeah. hard. It's Little hard to magazine. do a really great celebrity profile. It's um, yeah. like, how do you chart new territory? And I'm bringing it up because in a way that's what you're doing with the actor and Dee yeah. and Sasha yeah. because they're all coming from different yeah. points of yeah. view when it comes to art. And it's like, well, how do I write about writers that, oh, right? <sighs> You know, writing about, I mean, writing nonfiction about other people for me is really hard other than myself. I, I did um, I did a couple of profiles for the New Yorker. I did this pop band in Russia called Tattoo. God knows what happened to them. This was like 15, 20 years ago. I did one about this billionaire I met during my research for Lake Success. I, I mean, I have nothing but respect for journalists and, and profilers and biographers because it is so hard because often the person you're talking to, you know, we all like to present a version of ourselves and figuring out what the truth is or how as close as you can get to the truth is so hard. So hats off. I mean, it's much easier to just make everyone up because then you have the definitive, definitive version. Okay, we have time for a couple more questions and okay. I'm gonna ask a question from an immigrant from Leningrad around your age, who's wondering, Andrew Bazil is wondering, what type of content do you wish you could write but because you know it's not your strength, you're really sort of staying, going back a little bit from that. You know, I've worked on a lot of TV shows and like Succession, and I, I love them. My dream is to get better at, I mean, I, I write a pretty good, you know, I can write screenplay, no problem, because screenplays are all dialogue. And I think dialogue is a, is a, is a real strength of mine. Not to sound pretentious or no, dude, you know, it is. I will myself. totally back you on that. Okay, thank you. All right, yeah, I, I'm pretty good with dialogue, and and like I said, you know, screenplays are all dialogue. 
I wish I could be better at being able to enter the kind of three act pacing that a good episode of TV does. I think I am getting better, but I'm not there yet. And so I sometimes collaborate on stuff with a person, you know, a, a real Hollywood type person. And they're the ones that are able to sort of give me that. Because every part of my, and this book is as close as it gets to that because it does, it is structured as a four act play sort of. Uh, and it has a play in it, you know, uh, but that's as close as I've ever gotten to it. But usually I have a lot of trouble doing that. And I'm envious of people who, you know, the same way I'm envious of Taffy for being able to write such great profiles. I'm uh, envious of, um, you know, people who have that kind of screenwriting in their blood, in their bones, and are able to do a really good job with that, which I can't yet. Um, hey, I just realized before we go, um, I'm the only one who didn't see the poll results. Um, and so Harry, yeah, would you go ahead and show those poll results? I'm sorry, I wasn't ignoring them because I do want to know what the answers are. So if Harry can throw those up and then unfortunately we're going to have to let everyone go back to their regularly scheduled stuff for Tuesday afternoon, but hold on for two seconds. This is, we haven't tried polls before. Hmm. So Harry, if you could launch those results, I'm just curious more than anything. Um, and I thought I had the most recent version of Zoom, but apparently I'm behind. I, I, I don't, I don't, <laughs> I have no idea how this works. <laughs> um, well, I'm honestly, I'm glad to have it because that means we all get to hang out in a different way. I mean, yeah, there are times where I'm working from Los Angeles and it's really early and maybe I don't turn my camera on, which my colleagues know, that mm -hmm. is news to no one. Okay, these polls are still not popping up. So Gary, what's the thing that you really want readers to know about our country friends? Well, I think, you know, friendship is, I think you started the conversation with this, that friendship is, it feels weirdly enough like uncharted territory. It's not that things haven't been written about friends before and friendship uh, plays a role, especially in roles, I think it plays a role in, um, <clears throat> in books about younger people, you know, but as we age, things really devolve into novels about families and, you know, uh, children growing up and people not, you know, people, the, 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 the sort of um, friction between generations, which obviously is becoming even more so given that each generation now is so different from the last given how technology works. But I kind of wanted to capture what it's like to grow older and to still be reliant on a group of friends for almost everything, for so much of your joy and, and pleasure and, and sympathy and, and, you know, so it, it's a, it's strange to think about it, but it's, it's my book about growing up, you know, um, and I've never done that before because so many of the characters I've written about are so determined to stay, you know, young forever, you know, I mean, super sad true love story in a way is about uh, one of the characters never wants to die and is trying to figure out a way to stay immortal. But this is a book about mortality in some ways. Obviously, it's set against the um, um, against the uh, pandemic, which is all about mortality. But um, it is a book about coming to terms with all of these things. And I know some, some of us never do come to terms with all of these things. They're, they're heady stuff. But if I can write about them in a way that's hopefully entertaining for some of the for some of you readers, then that's uh, I will have accomplished my mission. Okay, and we're, we've gone behind the scenes and I have the poll results. Thank you, Harry. <laughs> I just wanna read them to you, Gary, cause they're really fun. Okay. So 52% um, of respondents said that yes, Our Country Friends was the first one of your books that they've read. Oh, so thank yay you. new readers. Welcome aboard. And then 52% have also seen some checkoff or read some checkoff. So we are right yeah. in our wheelhouse. 52 and, and 52, interesting. Yeah, but here's the here's the thing that gets me. Sasha is by far people's favorite character. No. Yeah, so really? it comes, seriously, Sasha comes in at 32%, Masha at 10%, Nat at 13 Karen really is bringing up, Karen's the caboose, she's 3%. Um, Vinud is 19, oh, Ed is in the caboose with Karen. You guys, you guys, oh, Korean wow. <laughs> brides had revisited, this guy was great. Well, was, um, what, what was his percentage? Uh, Ed, uh, Ed was three, and then D was six, and the actor is 13. So oh. Sasha, head and <laughs> the landowner is head and shoulders above. That's awesome, because that's me, you know? Yes, Thanks, I know, oh, I, I know, that's your avatar, it. Gary. Wow. That's why I needed to read that to you. Um, and then shocking. I tossed in one more question because I was just curious. Um, how do you feel about social media? We got to love it at 26%, hate it at 29, 16 can't, 16% can't live without it. And 29%, I don't really care. 
I could care less. <laughs> I had to throw that. I was curious. I was just like, you know, we all use social media that differently. Is so funny. Um, so funny. But I wanted to throw that in. But Gary, thank you so much for thank writing so our much. country yeah. friends. Thank you oh, for doing this you. goofy event. This was great. A a I shouldn't call it goofy, but you let me nerd yeah. out on yeah. you very, very hard. And the I questions were great. Appreciate all the nerding. Great questions. Wonderful questions. Thank you, Sorry, audience. You're, are all no, the questions for the, seriously, the questions were awesome. Thank you, you guys. Uh, just a reminder: you can buy the book at Barnes and Noble or online at Barnes and Noble. We have a special edition that has an essay from Gary about the writing of the book. There are also book club, uh, book group questions that are mm -hmm. included if you want to continue the conversation on your end. Pour it over the Barnes & Noble podcast. I am plugging this because Gary and I did a really fun show in November. We did. Uh, it was really fun. Pour it over is available wherever you get your podcasts. So follow us, rate us, review us, you know, all of that good stuff that we have to do to be part of the conversation. Gary, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Cannot thank you. wait to see what you do next. And uh, everyone have too. a great afternoon. <laughs> okay, thanks. Bye. Absolutely. Take care. Bye-bye.